This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, share what little we know about this next topic. Uh, the emergency oper I think which, when you're faced with an emergency operation, there are clearly some decisions that need to be made very, very quickly. Uh, first of all, I have no conflicts or uh, to, of interest to declare. With the advent of this new group of new oral anticoagulants, which we have elected to refer to as target-specific uh, oral anticoagulants because they do in fact target very specific parts in the coagulation cascade. They came onto the scene with a great deal of promise and I think they do offer us certainly a great number of options and opportunities. We presently have three that are commercially available and one that will be very likely will be commercially available very soon. Uh, we have one direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran or pradaxa, and three inhibitors of activated factor 10. I've illustrated on this slide the various pharmacokinetic and pharmacologic characteristics of these drugs, but I think really for the, our focus for and relevant, most relevant to the presentation today is what is their half-life? And you can see that the half-lives are very short. And this does provide us with a number of options in, the very, in a controlled clinical environment as well as perhaps uh, a little bit of safety compared to the standard, the vitamin K antagonist warfarin in the emergent situation. But unfortunately, there's no antidote. No, presently, there's no magic bullet. There's nothing that's available that can reliably and quickly reverse these agents. If we look at the various advantages and disadvantages for a moment, we can see that of the new agents, these new target-specific oral anticoagulants, they do have a rapid onset and a rapid offset. So they a rapid on and off. And this is clearly an advantage in the controlled situation of, a, of an elective procedure or where we have the luxury of time. Uh, they're easier to use perioperatively subsequently because we do have guidelines that give us some direction as far as how soon before an operation they should be discontinued and when they should be uh, resumed. Bridging is generally unnecessary, and as I think you probably appreciate, in patients who are on warfarin, we, we say that we can certainly bridge them with low molecular weight heparins, but low molecular weight heparins carry their own set of risks, uh, primarily which is, is bleeding, and they're, they're difficult to use. So with these new agents, the bridging is generally unnecessary. The lack of need for routine laboratory monitoring is, of course, an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage. And clearly, in this setting of an emergency uh, surgery, it's a disadvantage. There, there are, in fact, fewer drug interactions, a lack of dietary interactions, and, and a lower incidence of intracranial hemorrhage, which is of a, a, a benefit. Our inability to monitor them with routine laboratory tests is, of course, one of the reasons, or the, the lack of need has been one of the primary advantages that has been promoted by uh, for these agents. But similarly, we have an inability to monitor them. And I think from a, a routine clinical perspective, we just have to get over the fact that you do not require it. But once again, when you want to, we're faced with a number of uh, a dilemmas. Lack of reversibility, which of course will be the focus of my following comments. No current antidote. They are expensive. There is a risk from bleeding from other sites. And I think this is sometimes over, overlooked. Uh, Dabigatran, for example, has, and rivaroxaban, both have an increased incidence of GI bleeding, um, as well as some other problems. The other side effects, Dabigatran has an increased incidence of dyspepsia, and we're now starting to see some reports of patients who, in the face of de developing severe dyspepsia, turn, are turning out to perhaps have had an acute coronary event and assume that it was uh, due to GI. Uh, adherence, so they're twice-a-day drugs, and they are dependent upon the kidneys. So dose adjustment in patients 
And in those groups of patients who are sometimes the most likely candidates, need, we need to pay close attention to the serum creatinine. In the, in the controlled environment of a scheduled or planned procedure, these are the guidelines. And I'm not going to go over these, but they are based upon what the creatinine clearance is. But I wanted to emphasize briefly what can you do from a laboratory perspective to assess the residual effect of these drugs. Currently, there is no available assay for the drug concentration, which might be very helpful. Uh, even if this does become more routinely available, the turnaround time, turnaround time is likely to be so long that it may be of little clinical utility. So what we're left with is what impact do these drugs have on the routine coagulation tests? Dabigatran, a direct thrombin inhibitor, if you want to assess residual anticoagulant effect, the thrombin time is clearly the test to use. None of these are perfect. They don't, they have varying sensitivities based upon the concentration of the drug. But in the event that a patient comes in who's on dabigatran and you would like to get some assessment, the thrombin time is the one that is most uh, likely to reflect the residual uh, pharmacologic effect. For those of you at UCSF where I am, we have talked with our clinical lab. This is a test that's available to us seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So it, it is a useful test. You might, if you are not at UCSF, I think I would strongly suggest that you talk to your clinical labs and see if, in fact, this is something that's going to be available. Dabigatran or direct thrombin inhibitors can influence other measures of coagulation, but the reliability is very poor. The 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban and apixaban, there hopefully will soon be a, a specific anti-10A assay. Anti-10A assays are available now for low molecular weight heparin, such as uh, enoxaparin, but these need to be calibrated to these particular drugs, rivaroxaban and apixaban. So this is not something that's routinely available. In the absence of that for rivaroxaban, the prothrombin time is influenced, is generally the most sensitive uh, ref reflection of residual rivaroxaban effect. But there are some shortcomings, as uh, there are with many things, and that is that based upon the prothrombin time assay, there is varying sensitivity. But if you, if you obtain a, a prothrombin time which is close to normal, it is very likely that the residual pharmacologic effect is minimal. Rivaroxaban can also influence the APTT, but it has variable sensitivity. For apixaban, it's similar. Uh, Anti-factor 10A assay would be the, the gold standard. The prothrombin time and APTT are also influenced, and a near normal prothrombin time and APTT generally, generally reflects a low concentration of drug, but there is varying sensitivity. But unfortunately, at the present time, it's about the best that we've got. And there are guidelines for both normal renal function and for uh, abnormal renal function. So what to consider in the event of a patient requiring an emergency operation and is on one of these new drugs? Well, assessing for residual anticoagulant effect, of course, is important. Um, the doses uh, it does a short, and, and another question, of course, is does a shortened coagulation test imply hemostasis? And this does not seem to be completely concordant that in many of the, with much of the experience that has been gained with uh, these drugs is that even though the prothrombin time can a, appear to be near normal, it doesn't mean that overall hemostasis is near normal. Uh, the, the decreased prothrombin time ratio uh, may represent a decreasing drug concentration. I would caution you, when a prothrombin time is ordered, you will always get an INR. But recall that an INR has only been standardized for warfarin or for the vitamin K antagonists. And the INR represents a standardization of the prothrombin time ratio. So it's really important, albeit a, a somewhat subtle distinction, to look at the prothrombin time or the APTT. In a patient who requires an emergency operation, what about the use and necessity for bridging off or bridging back on? When do you resume the anticoagulants? And 
What is clear with these agents, that an advantage of a short half-life, a short onset and short offset, is and what was recognized in one of the large atrial fibrillation trials when patients were trans, uh, transitioned from study drug back to warfarin, that there is a time period if a patient has a high, highly thrombotic disease when they're off the drug because it wears, these drugs do wear off quickly, that they are at risk for thrombosis. And so this clearly needs to be evaluated. Uh, and the risks with neuroaxial anesthesia and analgesia with these drugs. If there is residual uh, drug effect, the use of, uh, of any kind of epidural catheter does carry an additional risk. So management options clearly hold the drug. Um, it's important that we stop the drug. And also, we do have several options that may be available to us. What we've done at UCSF is develop some guidelines for reversal of these agents. And they're really a result of, a, of, of expert opinion because there's very little data to, uh, su to uh, support this. So the, would, there's never going to be a large-scale randomized clinical trial where you're going to subject patients to uh, concentrations of these drugs and then perform a, an, an invasive procedure. But what it does is it outlines how to reverse these agents in the event of any kind of major hemorrhagic event. Or, and we've then... Um, translated this in how to manage patients who may be subject or require an emergent uh, procedure. There's a number of issues that can, a number of uh, interventions that can be performed individually with these drugs. Dabigatran uh, is removed by dialysis, but it's unlikely that this could be, is, is a relevant um, option in the event of somebody who needs an emergent procedure. And it's also uh, problematic from establishing access and it's not all that effective as well. If a patient is on dabigatran and emergent reversal is required, what appears to be the most useful is uh, FIBA, or a, an activated uh, um, uh, prothrombin complex concentrate. And the dosages that we've come up with pretty much represent what is used uh, by, by those who have reported its success. It's 80 units per kilogram. For apixaban and rivaroxaban, there is now available a four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate uh, that we are uh, extrapolating from reported use with this drug and outcomes with it as the most likely agent to help restore normal hemostasis and return the prothrombin time back towards a, a normal range. Uh, the, the product for name of this drug is called Kcentra, and I'll make some comments about that specifically. I think not to be lost in the discussion of how to manage these agents in the setting of an emergent procedure is to also look at the other agents that patients are on, because in many cases, patients who are receiving these drugs also have concomitant uh, comorbidities and, and may be on potent antiplatelet agents. Also keeping in mind that while these agents may, this agent, Kcentra, may be the four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate may be effective in, in reversal of these agents, that once again, the strength of indication for an antithrombotic agent will be now eliminated. Part of the problem is that if a patient has had, had a recent thrombotic event, certainly within the last three months, with administration of these drugs, you in fact do see a, a higher incidence of thrombosis than using alternative methods. Fresh frozen plasma is generally not recommended. It doesn't work for these patients. It requires a large amount of volume. It needs to be administered over, slow, uh, slow, uh, over a long period of time. So, but in, in general, it just doesn't work. We also factor seven, uh, activated factor seven, is, is not recommended for use in these patients. Uh, because it doesn't seem to work, and it does carry a high risk of, of thrombotic events. The, this agent does contain uh, the four factors, 2, 7, 9, and 10. It also contains some protein C, some protein S, and it also contains heparin. So if a patient has any history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, they're contraindicated uh, for th that reason. So case entry is, is FDA approved for the reversal of vitamin K antagonists, warfarin, it is not currently FDA approved for the reversal of these new uh, target-specific oral anticoagulants. Uh, there's little clinical trial data 
uh, that's available to date to support their, their efficacy. There is some. Uh, it's mostly anecdotal evidence. It's in healthy volunteers, but it does seem to demonstrate that it can reverse um, the uh, coagulation parameters. And it, you must consider the risk of thrombotic events in susceptible patients and, of course, balance this risk for hemorrhage. What about the future? Well, there are, uh, fortunately, uh, several, uh, several ongoing trials looking at specific antidotes for these drugs, uh, one that's being done locally. There is one uh, called Andexanet, which will be useful, f reported to be useful for apixaban and rivaroxaban and edoxaban, the 10A, factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, so far, it's just been performed in healthy volunteers. There's another one, a fab fragment for dabigatran. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that during the, the time periods that we have set aside for discussion, there may be some questions. My personal opinion is that dabigatran is probably going to be falling into uh, much less use and our direction, our attention will be directed more towards the 10A inhibitors, but there is a fab fragment in work, as well as another, uh, some specific antidotes for uh, the 10A inhibitors. So I thought I would conclude with my presentation just by a quick audience response. 72-year-old male with a need for emergent abdominal exploration. History of atrial fibrillation taking a Pixaban five milligrams twice a day. So what are the, here are the options. One, proceed with the operation immediately due to the urgency. Obtain a thrombin time and proceed if normal. Consider administration of four units of fresh frozen plasma. Consider administration of FIBA or consider administration of K-Centra. Okay, well, this is good and this is not so good. Uh, <laughs> So proceed with the operation immediately. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this in your hands. If you feel that you are confident and comfortable not knowing the degree of uh, anticoagulation, that would be OK. Obtain a thrombin time. Recall that a thrombin time is only for direct thrombin inhibitors. So it only assesses the status of dabigatran and not rivaroxaban or apixaban. So that would not be valuable. Uh, consider administration of four units of fresh frozen plasma. No, that wouldn't work. FIBA, again, that's directed for direct thrombin inhibitors. So the correct answer or the best answer would be consider administration of Kcentra. Clearly, there's other things you would, you would want to consider and evaluate. But Okay, so we'll look forward to the discussion. <laughs>